Tom uh, Groskov is going to talk to us about the New South Wales uh, scheme um, of uh, biobanking. Um, Tom, your director. Tom's, Tom's the director in the New South Wales Department running the biobanking scheme, uh, and he'll tell you all about that one. I'll find you. Let me, um, let me get started whilst it's doing whatever it's doing. Um, and I'll start with an acknowledgement to Anne, who has just delivered a whole lot of really difficult concepts really, really well. So I might, um, I might skim over a few of those because a number of those concepts are uh, consistent. However, um, let's, I'll, give, I'll talk a little bit about, I'll give you a sense of what's going on in New South Wales and then we'll get into the, into the detail of the bits and pieces. So, biobanking. Voluntary market-based scheme, yep. Rigorous and repeatable assessment framework. So we separate, in our minds, we separate the assessment part of the job from the decision about whether or not something's a, a, a biobanking scheme or it goes into an, a different framework for offsetting. What we're trying to do is to provide a consistent framework for the way that we do all assessments. So if we step away from biobanking and put it in its offsetting context, biobanking has an improved or maintain, maintain, improve or maintain environmental outcomes standard, which is not consistent with what our Planning Act's about. Our Planning Act is about a balanced social, economic and environmental and ESD outcome. The biobanking scheme says that's not a high enough standard. The standard that we're looking for here is an improve or maintain environmental outcome standard. I'm not particularly concerned about the social and economic dimension. So to be fully in the biobanking scheme, your, your project, your development, will in fact improve or maintain environmental outcomes, not balanced by social and economic. However, we do know that the planning scheme doesn't operate that way and that we do know that you know, the ESD principle exists in that framework. So the assessment component is the piece which is consistent and then outcome, different outcomes can be achieved. An ESD outcome, a net loss outcome, if it's a state significant development. If you've got a hump and great coal mine or a coal port or a major, you know, a highway between Sydney and Brisbane and whatever else, the government sort of says, well, guess what, you know? We're, we're going to sacrifice environmental values here. Biobanking in its purest form cannot operate there, but the assessment framework can. And the key thing that is brought by that kind of an assessment framework is an objective, repeatable and quantifiable set of values for the environment. And this is a major change. This is a major step forward in thinking about the environment because we've had a currency about ec the economy for a very long time and we all carry it in our back pocket or in our handbag or wherever we might carry it, but we've not had that currency for the environment and we're giving it that. That starts a very different discussion and a very different dialogue about offsetting. I'll get back to the presentation. So... What does the scheme actually do? It delivers secure and resourced offsets and it reduces red tape. What this is about is about empowering the private, in part, it's about empowering the private sector to manage this process for itself and getting government out of the way. So who are the participants? Landowners, they create credits by entering into agreements and then there are developers or conservationists or traders or governments or the philanthropic sector or whoever else that may want to play in this space and they can go and buy those credits which are generated. So the credits are basically environmental improvement um, and there are people that will, for a range of reasons, want to purchase that. But let's talk about the 90%, you know, the, where, where's 90% of this business? And it's in the developers' part of the world. So keeping the colours to make things simple, the agreement side is the supply side of the equation. They're landowners. They have a biobank site. They have an agreement. That is the legal instrument. It's called an agreement. They sell credits and they undertake management actions. On the demand side of things, let's talk about developers because that's what we're really about. Developers, they have a development site which is going to have an impact on the environment. They have a statement. That's the legal instrument. And it says you must have this many credits to, in order to proceed. They buy credits. They retire those credits. They take them out of the market. The key difference here is if I'm a philanthropic organisation, I may purchase that credit, hold it. I don't retire it. I hold it. I now have an asset. That asset may increase in value and I may sell it in the future or I may just retain it. Depends. So you create an opportunity for, the spec for a speculator to participate in this market as well. The transaction. 
very similar to the transaction in, in Victoria. Basically, the buyer turns up with a bag of money. This used to be animated and it was really good fun because everything would spin around. But the buyer turns up with a bag of money. He gives or she gives or it gives some of that money directly to the buyer bank site owner, the landowner that's going to undertake some management actions, and they put some of that money into a trust fund. That trust fund is invested in the market and does all of its things and makes annual payments for the performance of management actions in perpetuity. It's an in-perpetuity agreement to undertake the action. It's an in-perpetuity payment for those actions. It's registered on title, yep, 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 yep. You all know that. Let's get to the exciting slide. I'll come back to the others. So what's in that? So we have the trust fund. That's part A. So that is the cost of management actions and other recurring costs for the life of the agreement. We have a, we have a calculator which is up on the web which people can use to actually work out what that is. And you put in your fencing costs and you put in your weed management costs and your feral animal control costs and this and that. And then in 15 years' time or 10 years' time you put in the, oh, we'll have a fencing replacement cost here and... And it's all put back in using some very smart actuarials that cost me a hell of a lot of money. And they said, right, you know, and here's a net present value. And in it goes. And they did all the really smart actuarial stuff about, you know, what would be the investment price and what's the discount rate and all of that sort of bizzo. And that's all there. So that's part A, the total fund deposit. And then, of course, this is a market. You've got to have part B, which is the landowner, the return to the landowner. So what do they want out of it? What's their profit motive? What is the demand and supply? How is that driving price? What can they possibly get for it? And we've, we've had some interesting experience. We've had um, two trades in Cumberland Plain Woodlands in, in Sydney with radically different um, price profiles in, in that part B. One was done by the church, who were just looking for a certain amount of money in order to manage uh, an asset that they had. The other by a private landowner who was seeking market value, and the prices are quite different. Um, and we'll see, you know, we'll see that play out in different ways. The Historic Houses Trust has just recently uh, been um, uh, undertaken a biobanking agreement and they took nothing in Part B. They simply wanted the Part A costs covered. That's how, that's how it worked. So there's that. So people like the numbers. Here we're not talking hectares, here we're talking credits. How many credits per hectare depends on the quality of the site and its condition, what management actions are required to bring it up. So, you know, a site will generate different credits depending on the condition of the vegetation that's there. So the price per credit, you can see there, St Mary's Towers is the church, Brownlow Hill is the, um, is the private developer, and you can see their first trade. So there's those two Brownlow Hills are off the same biobanking agreement, two separate trades. Um, one he sold at 8000 per credit and the other at 9500 per credit. His fixed cost was the same. Um, that landowner put seven hundred thousand dollars in his back pocket. Um, that was just his, you know. That was, and that's off twenty-two hectares. Um, so yeah, Bueller is the historic houses trust. Uh, nothing there. So that's seven hundred thousand. Thank you very much for taking that to the bank. That the uh, the balance is in the trust fund and is an annual payment to him, which covers his management costs. Interesting on that one, labour is included in that cost and he has immediately gone out and purchased that service from somebody else. He spends his time managing his dairy farm and he has somebody else managing his African olive problem, which is eating up his Cumberland Plain woodland. He's a happy man. All right, dancing around. Um, you've got a whole lot of stuff in there that I won't worry about too much. Let's talk a little bit about... Let's talk a little bit about success. Success requires a number of things like in any market, and suitable market conditions are generally outside our control. So I'm not going to talk much beyond saying, geez, the GFC was a real bummer, um, and the Sydney housing market uh, was a real... What happened there it was a real bummer to, the, to sort of when we launched the scheme because suddenly everybody went, whoa, I'm not sure, we don't feel like taking risks, it's not, we're not feeling bullish and all that sort of stuff, and things really slowed. You know, that sort of the initial... Uh, enthusiasm for the scheme cooled very quickly when we came, when we actually went to market. However, there are other... Th so that's outside your control and there's not much you can do about that. Um, 
but there are the other four there are. So credible information base here is, is absolutely critical. Political and operational stability is vital. Market transparency and efficient process, and I'll talk a little bit about each of these. Credible information base. This is, um, for those of you who have friends or family in the uh, information security world, the CIA of uh, information security is all about confidentiality, integrity and access. And this is really critical. Those that need to gain access need to have access. And I mean that from both the side, from the side of those who want to discover price, uh, discover information, understand supply, do all of that sort of stuff. They've got to be able to get access, easy and credible access to that information. And for those that need to maintain information sources, they also need to do it. The market is alive. You've got to, it's got to be current. It's got to be credible. It's got to move. Integrity is all about the quality and the coverage. You can't have big black holes in your data set and you cannot have uncertainty about it. The only thing I know about markets, absolutely in my bones, is in an unstable market, nobody trades. If there's, if there's speculation, if there's uncertainty, if the scheme is not seen as robust, either politically or in its operation, nobody will trade because they will wait for a better deal. Confidentiality, um, you know, political and operational risks and the pecuniary interest, I mean, you know, we actually did... You know, this is where you get into stuff like you do penetration tests to see whether people can get in and hack your data. Because it's actually got to be stable. You've got to have confidence in it and you've got to know that it's right. And as soon as somebody puts some dollars on the table, they want to know that they paid the right price for it as well. Otherwise, they're going to come back and sue you. Stability. So political stability. Uh, I made a very flippant comment, and I know this is being recorded, so I won't repeat it. Um, <laughs> Uh, last night, but, uh, you know, political stability. We had, uh, I think it was five environment ministers in the last term of our government, which was four years. Uh, a mate of mine went on leave and uh, he missed an entire minister. Um, <laughs> that's, that's not... That doesn't breed a lot of confidence, you know, when you've got that kind of political instability. And, and you know, for those of you who follow the Sydney media, when you have property developers gunned down in the street by other property developers and you get, uh, you know... Ministers being taken to court and you've got ICAC inquiries, etc. Everybody's kind of hanging back, waiting for a better deal. So political stability, the election cycle, the quality of ministerial decisions in relation to major developments. And what I mean by quality there is not the outcome, I mean the transparency of it. Do people understand it? Is it logical? Does it fit within the political framework or the regulatory framework which was established? Those are the critical questions. And the cross-portfolio jurisdictional issues. So you know, people like Feech and I have been talking for a number of years about, you know, the Australian Government's EPBC Act um, offsetting program and what's happening in the state. These things need to come together because as far as the public and the development sector is concerned, they don't see the diff... They are flat out seeing the differences between the Australian Government and the New South Wales Government. They certainly don't see the differences between organisations or agencies within the jurisdictions, whether that's regional NRM bodies, state government agencies or local government uninterested. What does the government want? And it's got to be in one place. Operational stability, you know, we've got to do a two-year statutory review. Wow, geez, we really didn't need that right just when things were starting to kick off. You know, you get six trades going. Oh, guess what? We're going to do an operational review. Market withdraws again. You know, you get that, you get that concern. Will there be a better deal? Will things change? What are the opportunities for me coming around the track? Operational practice, when you codify a system of decision-making, what you do is you tend to normalise the result, but you, you will sti still get variation. The variation should be narrower than it was in the past, but you'll still get variation. It's, is that variation understood, and does it, does it exist within what people would consider an acceptable framework? That's really a, an important part of operational stability. Methodology review and improvement. You never get it right the first time, so you've got to be able to stage it. You've got to be able to bring in new information. You've got to be able to continue to move as your knowledge and understanding of the systems and of the environment improves. And scheme promotion and, cha and champions. I mean, you know, uh, Anne made the comment that they've never advertised it since and they've got over 300 people uh, already trading and they've, there's willing players and that sort of stuff. Supply for us has been a little bit more difficult and, uh, and is something that we're turning our minds to. How do we, in fact ensure supply. We have a more of a supply than a demand problem at the moment in, 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 at this current stage in our scheme. 
Transparency, the public register. We have a public register. It's up on the web. It reveals price, volume, location, types. So one of the things I, I skipped over when I ran through a few slides um, is that the biobanking scheme operates on two types of credits, ecosystem credits and species credits. Ecosystems credits are for ecological communities and the things that are well predicted to fit within them. And, you know, I'll use the koala as the example. Generally, we know the habitat for koalas and the kinds of trees and that sort of stuff, and we can pretty much predict where they're going to be by the habitat that exists. So they are an ecosystem's species. There are other species, like the border thick-kneed gecko, um, that could, arrive in, could be in many different types of habitats. So if you're going to have an impact on that species, you've got to, you've got to offset that species. So we have no indirects in this scheme. This is like for like, and it's a like for like or better, and we trade at a, and the ecosystems level, we trade at a, um, we have formations, we have 14 formations, about 100 classes, and then we have vegetation types, about 1,600 underneath. We trade at the, the, the type to class level, and that's the kind of thing that happens there. So if you're in the Sydney Basin and you're impacting on Cumberland Plain, you will find your offset, whether it's ecosystem or species, you will find your offset on the Cumberland Plain. But if you're in a sandstone transition forest, which is the sort of the escarpment country of, uh, which is typical along New South Wales, you could be trading from the central coast to the north coast. It depends on what it is and, and, and whether that suite of species uh, is found in the two different types of ecosystems. That details in the, in the presentation. So there's got to be that transparency. People need to know what are they trading in and what's the price, what's the volume, what's the location. No worries. Uh, buyers and sellers, uh, they need to be able to find each other, they need to be able to know who each other are and they, there needs to be some parity about um, their ability to negotiate with each other. Methods and tools are publicly available. So our methodology is publicly available. It's up there. We've uh, trained and accredited over 70 private consultants to actually deliver this. We don't do it. They do it, and they, and they deliver. And all of our tools are up on the web, and, the, and they're able to be used by anybody who's accredited. Efficient process, this is the key. The cost of capital is a really big cost to the development sector. One of the things that concerns them most is when they get into the government process, we can spin around for quite some time. One of, our, one of the biobanking statements arrived to us with no prior warning and was dealt with in 12 days. That was it all over Red Rover. No year to sort out the offsets or anything else, 12 days done. And it was a development that had previously been hanging around for nearly three years. That's, that's the power of the, of the tool. It can actually work that way. Agency process improvement. We do have a role in checking and making sure things are happening, you know, and that the assessments are reasonable and all that sort of stuff, and that somebody hasn't just made up the data, but we've got to do that efficiently and effectively, and we have a guarantee of service to make sure we do that, and that guarantee of service fits within the same framework as the guarantee of service given by local government. I'll leave it there. <laughs>